what is going on? No, I'm just kidding. Hey, Cathel, can you shut those doors? Awesome. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. It, I really think this may be the best stretch of weather. The, I'm like, this is at, like, this is Akron. That's where I grew up. That's like Northeast Ohio. It's like, it's never nice this long, right? So uh, let's take this blessing from God. A couple of quick announcements. So today, during the prayer time, we're going to announce our graduates. We have three of them here today. So we'll be doing a little recognition for them here shortly. Tonight is a youth group. We're going to be meeting at the Burroughs house from 4.30 to 6.30, okay? Um, from 4.30 to 5.30 for about an hour, we're going to be decorating the trailer and the truck for the parade tomorrow. And then from 5.30 to 6.30, we're going to do what I had planned for us to do last week, okay? So uh, be there tonight if you can make it. Tomorrow is the Memorial Day parade. So what do you need to know? Memorial Day parade. We would love to see all of you marching with us. We're going to line up and ask everyone to be there about 9.15, 9.30, over there off of Loretta Drive at Neomed. Just ask some of the Lions people that are wearing red vests where the Fairhaven float is, and they will point you to the number of where we're at, okay? We're going to have two pickup trucks and a trailer, so if you want to ride, there should be plenty of room to ride. We're going to need a few people walking, too. I'll be walking. It's hard to get a selfie with anyone when you're on the trailer, so... Uh, we walk in handing out flyers, handing out Bibles, doing stuff like that. We have things to throw out. Um, wear your church merch, okay? If you don't have church merch, just wear red, white, and blue or, you know, wear some Rootstown Rover gear, anything like that, right? It's a Rootstown parade. It's a short parade. The parade kicks off at 10 o'clock. Um, it'll end up at the cemetery. It's usually only about 20 minutes to get there. It's not very long. And then there's a little ceremony down at the cemetery, I've been asked to do the invocation and the benediction for the ceremony. Would love to see us have a huge turnout for that tomorrow. Uh, bring a, a bag of candy to throw also, a bag or two of candy um, to throw uh, tomorrow as well. All right, sound good? If you guys do have questions about the parade, see me before you leave. But we had such a great participation in it last year. Would love to see us have huge particip participation in it again this year. All right, um, so there's that. Uh, also, Vacation Bible School. I know it sounds like it's a long ways off, but it's coming up July 15th. If you were not able to make today's meeting at 10, there's gonna be another meeting in two weeks. Wait, why is she shaking her head at me? Oh, okay. Look, do you wanna make an announcement? Okay. <laughs> you all have just seen a glimpse of what happens at our house every single day. Okay, it's just a little glimpse of what happens every day. As long as it ends with we're good, then we're good to go. All right, also June, we're gonna be coming up here today. Um, teenagers got class back there. Um, starting next week, we'll be breaking for the summer so that we can all worship together here in the, in the sanctuary. Um, we are gonna have a couple of summer events on June 14th. Wednesday night is gonna be our Haven of Rest night for youth group, and that will be our summer kickoff stopping at Swenson's afterwards, okay? So we're going to Swenson's afterwards for that. Uh, so be there for that. Um, everything else, just look, we did set a date of August 14th for Baptism Sunday. If you are interested in being baptized, if you never have before, um, or you or your kids, family want to be baptized, um, come talk to me, okay? And we'll, we'll uh, uh, get it in there on the, on the 14th. All right. Brothers and sisters, I think that's it. It's for, oh, and this is the last week, Linda. This is the last week for Ravens Packs. So this week, if you've got some microwave popcorn, um, let us know, because then that goes silent over the summer, right? Is that, okay. So microwave popcorn, this week, let us know. We'll figure out how to get it to Linda, and then we'll pick this up again in the fall. Oh, and signups for teardown and setup. So yesterday, so signups are out there. We had one extra person come yesterday right, who signed up. I'm just telling you this so you know. We started setting up at 9.05 and we were done at 9.27, right? You get a couple of extra hands here. It's a great ministry and a great, great way to serve. Um, today, actually, we're gonna be talking about some of the stuff that happens behind the scenes and how that feeds the life of the church. So sign up for that back there. See John back there. We really wanna put together a nice team of folks 
that know how to set up uh, the church. All right? I think that's it now as far as assignments go or announcements go. So with that, brothers and sisters, this is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Why don't you stand with me as we open up our worship service this week?
All right, before I call our graduates up here, uh, just a couple of things that we're praying for. Um, the Bennett family is all doing better, but continue to pray for them. Also pray for uh, Dave Vazel, Eric Corwin, who both had um, treatment for their cancer and got some good news. So continue to pray um, that that goes well uh, for them. Pray for J.D. Uh, Langeth, who we've been praying for. And uh, pray that his cancer diagnosis continues to go well also. Also, uh, keep the McLaughlin family in your prayers. A lot of you uh, know uh, Sean Matthew McLaughlin, who I believe um, he's Dale's age. I could be wrong. He's like 17 years old. Uh, but um, Sean suddenly passed away in his sleep uh, last week. He's only 50 years old. Jason, what did I say, Sean? I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, Jason, Mc I know Lori's like, he gets, I get every name wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, Jason passed away suddenly in his sleep. Um, at the age of 50, and uh, they're dealing with a lot. Uh, so keep that entire family um, in your prayers. Um, anything else that we should be praying for? Um, any other prayer requests or praises this week? Yeah, please. Go ahead. That's awesome, yeah. Praise God. Praise God. That's awesome. All right. Oh, Linda. Oh, well, guess what? You're going to be praising a lot because she's going to get a gift here in a minute. Yeah, definitely. Well, with that then, and that really is a praise, our graduates. So we have five. Three of them are here today. So I'm going to have our three graduates come up, um, Andy and Trinity and my son, Dale, which I'm not sure my son, Dale, won. Oh, man. All right, just go ahead and line up here at the mics. I knew when he said, when exactly am I coming up? I said, right after the second song, he said, okay, and then he disappeared. So I knew, I knew that was coming. Oh, man. All right, so... These are our two graduates that are up here. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna grab this too. So what we like to do every year for um, graduate recognition is just have them come up. Oh, here he comes, come on, Dale. Hey. Oh, look, there's three of you and there's three mics. So this works out really good. So here's just a little gift from the church for all of you as you go forward. Here you go, Dale. It's a little journal. Uh, we kind of started giving out journals a few years ago and someone actually told me how much their kid uses it and they love it. It was actually a Mason Klein. Uh, I found out that he just absolutely loves his journal. So I think we're gonna keep with these going. Uh, the two that aren't here are uh, Aubrey Klein and Joe Crawford. So we still have a gift for them. We'll catch up with them afterwards. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have each one of you and your own respective mic introduce yourself and say where you're graduating from um, and where you're gonna, what you're going to be doing in the fall or over the summer, and uh, kind of some future plans. Sound good? Dale, do you want to go first? Okay, Andy, why don't you go first here? Um, I'm Andy. Um, I'm graduating from Ritztown, and I'm going to Kent State for early childhood Um, I'm Trinity. I'm graduating from Streetsboro High School, and I'm going to Kent State for a degree in psychology. Uh, I'm Dale. I'm graduating from uh, Miss Tommy and Newport, and I'm going to Kent State for animation. Awesome. So we got three future flashes, which is always a good thing coming from a former flash, old flash over here. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, they did in the New Testament too, actually. Jesus was anointed. Um, the apostles were anointed. Just as kind of a way of like putting our blessing on you, right? The church is kind of gonna be praying over you as you're gonna be going out now in this 
next phase of your life, right? Or this next era of your life, right? And from high school, this is a big transition, right? College is a big transition and kind of getting out there in life more. So um, I'm going to anoint them all and then we're going to pray and I want all of you to be in prayer for them also, okay? So Andy, I always call her little Burl, so you're going to hear that. Little Burl, I anoint you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Trinity, I anoint you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And Dale, <laughs> I anoint you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Brothers and sisters, why don't you help me pray for these students? And actually, I don't know, mom, mom, dads, if you guys want to come up and put your hands on and pray with them too, you're more than welcome to. You know, grandma, grandpa, if you guys want to come up or if you're taking pictures, you can do that too. But this is a big deal. Siblings, Lucy, if you want to come up, that's all right. All right. Yeah, it's okay if you cry. Go ahead. Come on. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. This is just a a little representation of how much we love our kids, right? Let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, I I pray that you would bless and be with these students that are here, these young men and women that are going to be taking the next step in their life. Lord, we pray for Andy. We pray for Trinity. We pray for Dale. Lord, watch their footsteps. Guide them and keep them safe from harm. Lord, fill their minds with the wisdom that only you can give. Lord, fill their hearts with the Holy Spirit that they may be compassionate, kind, loving, and wise, Lord. Lord, we pray that they shine like stars in the dark universe that's out there, that they're a light and that they can be a hope pointing people towards you with everything that they do. Lord, in those times when they have questions and don't know what they're doing, may they seek you. May they stay close to you and may they build a close relationship with you. Lord, watch over them in all things. Lord, we pray for the moms and the dads that are up here, who, Lord, for for 18 years have watched and taken care of their kids and now seeing them move into the next phase of life. Lord, keep them safe. Let them know that this church community loves them. Let them know that this church community is their home. Let them know that they can always come back and find rest and find peace and find strength. Jesus, we love these children very much and you love them even more than we do. So bless them in all things. And we ask for this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, now graduates, stay up here because you're helping me. Dale, come here. You take this, and you two take this, and stay on that side. Where's our Leia? Leia, come here. Dale, you and our Leia do this. Or, here, since your family's on this side, Dale, you do this side with our Leia and Trinity. All right, let's bow our heads up. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, let's pray for our gifts. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we pray that you would bless and be with the gifts that we're going to receive. We pray, well, we pray and lift up to you, Lord, all the people that we're praying for, Lord, including J.D., uh, David, for the McLaughlin family, Lord God, uh, for Eric, continue to bless and be with them. We pray for the gifts that we receive, Lord, that they're given with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. Jesus, we love you. Bless us and be with us always. We ask for this in your name. Amen.
Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us the space where we can come together and worship you this morning. Uh, Lord God, bless the message. Um, help each and every one of us take it to heart and um, take the lessons that you taught us in your word and help us to apply them to our lives to be the best um, representatives of you that we can be. Uh, Lord God, uh, be with all the prayer requests today, both spoken and unspoken. Um, keep your healing hand on everyone who needs it, Lord, and uh, just bless this message and uh, be with it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let foundation stay in today, Lori, I think. Yeah, let's stay in today. Um, I know it's Memorial Day, and I just want to touch on this real quick. And, and some of you may have heard um, the story before, but I think it bears repeating as we commemorate the, our veterans that have fallen um, you know, America, like everything else in the world, has its problems, right? But foundationally, America is a good country, okay? And uh, what I always like to remember on Memorial Day, where we're honoring the veterans that, that lost their lives in service, veterans that have passed away, um, is the story that my grandma used to tell. And I know that the story is true because I actually saw this story happen on Band of Brothers, just here recently, story that my grandma has told in our family since the time that I could understand. But back, I believe it was 1943 when Patton made landfall into Sicily. It might have been 1942, I don't remember. 1943 when, when Patton made landfall into Sicily. They landed on the beach where my hometown is. One of the places where they landed in Sicily is the beach where my hometown is not more than a mile and a half from where my grandparents, my great grandma's house was. So in the weeks leading up to Patton making landfall, all they talked about on the radio was the Americans are coming and they're gonna kill you all and they're gonna rape your women and they're gonna kill your children. They're bad, they're evil. You know, they made Patton out to be a monster and this is all they heard on the radio. This is all they heard. Stay away from the Americans. Don't believe anything they tell you. Don't all this stuff, right? So they're getting scared. They're knowing that this, this force is coming on, right? And so um, by this time, Italy was dirt poor. Um, my grandma tells stories that they hadn't eaten in weeks. All food, all metal, all money was all going to the war effort. Everything was rationed. They had very little to eat. She said they, didn't, they weren't able to have metal utensils. They had to use wood utensils because all metal was going to the war effort. They weren't able to have uh, wedding bands because all metal was going to the war effort. They had nothing. And at this point, um, they hadn't eaten in weeks. And finally, they heard um, the siren go off that they saw the American ships in the distance and they were getting ready to make landfall. So she said they all went into the center part of the house. They put wet towels and wet rags at the bottom of the doors, at the bottom of the windows, because they thought they were gonna get gassed. They thought all of this horrible stuff, right? And she said, it seemed like it was ours. She was little then, right? She, she was very little, her, her little sisters, my, my uncle Dominic, all of them, all very little. She said they started to hear the heavy equipment in the tanks rolling down Main Street, and they were just waiting to start hearing the gunshots and screaming. She said, instead, she goes, they heard noise, but they didn't know what it was, but they thought it sounded like cheering. So they opened the doors to see what was going on. And she said, um, there was a, a row of tanks, a row of tanks, and all these kids were rushing up to the tanks, and these American soldiers were handing each kid these huge Hershey bars. And it was the first thing they had had to eat and that rapper sat in my great grandma Rosina's house in a frame in her one bedroom. I remember this little kid. And um, it was after that that my grandma wanted us boys to always have flat top haircuts. Because she would always say, those Americans, they were so good looking. They smiled so good. Their necks were so clean. They were so, and that's all she would always say. And um, that was when everything really turned in Italy because she said they realized that, that everything that they were told was not true, that everything that they were told was a lie. So on Memorial Day, at least for me, that's what I like to remember. 
how many people fell to get people who were living under those kinds of repressive governments a little taste of the freedom that we have. So be in prayer for that. Tomorrow at the parade, when you get down to the cemetery and you hear the words that are said for the fallen soldiers and you see those graves that are marked as military uh, veterans that had served, say an extra little thank you for them because they really have given a lot in service to their country, okay? With that, we'll, we'll recognize the veterans that are alive at Veterans Day in November. But for this one, we'll recognize those that have passed. All right, so now that I've cried for Dale and cried for the kids and cried for this, now we can get into the sermon where I'm sure to cry again. But we're gonna be in 1 Corinthians chapter four. 1 Corinthians chapter four, as we continue on in our, in our uh, 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 series here in 1 Corinthians, we're gonna read verses one through 13, but verses one through five is what we're gonna focus on. So 1 Corinthians chapter four, one through 13, but we're really gonna focus on verses one through five. And today we're gonna be talking about authority, accountability, and appraisal, which if any of you work anywhere and you do like a year-end review, this sounds like the beginning of your year-end review, but that's not really what this is about. And I think you'll soon see what we're talking about here with authority, accountability, and appraisal. So if you got your Bibles open, want to follow along, 1 Corinthians chapter four, starting at verse one. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God, with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. For my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us against the other. For who else makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that, you also, so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so strong. We are honored, you are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world right up to this moment. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, be with us this day and fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit to make us tender to the leading of your word. Fill our minds and our ears with the Holy Spirit to make us attentive to your word, that we may learn your word, that we may love your word, and that we may live your word. And we ask for this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So understand when you read some of that word, those words that Paul is writing, that's rough, Right? But remember, back then he's writing this letter to Corinthians. The majority of the church is illiterate. So there's a designated reader who is standing up and saying, hey, Paul sent us a letter and he reads this letter. And he's writing this letter in such a way, you know, remember the Greeks put a big emphasis on kind of like this discussion and debate. So he's using words under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's using words to, to really kind of combat what's going on there. I, I was trying to think of like, what's a good, expo I, I don't know a good, a good like illustration. The only thing I could think of like is maybe if you remember like the video for Beat It, right? So these dudes like meet each other in the street and like they're street toughs and they're ready to fight, but they're ready to fight. But then what happens? They dance, right? So like they're like killing each other with dance moves, right? Or, or if you watch like West Side Story, right? You see like the Jets and what are the other ones? The, the Sharks and the Jets, you know, yeah, man, we're gonna rumble, you know, but you're not really fighting, you're dancing, right? 
Or we could really do like break into electric boogaloo, right? With, you know, well, anyway, I'm just getting carried away. But really what, what yeah, well, Shabbadoo. Um, really all, 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 all that's going on here is that Paul is, is, is combating them with his words. That's why he's using this like harsh language. Like when Paul's up there saying, well, we're scum and you guys are great. And we're the, everyone listening to this is like, Ugh, guys, I, I think we did something wrong, right? That's, that's really what, what Paul is here conveying to us. So let's kind of see where we are. We've, been, we've gone through the first three chapters of Corinthians and by now you probably have an idea of what the problem is in the Corinthian church. What's the problem? The problem is that the church is fighting with each other. The, the problem is that there's divisions within the church. There's factions, alliances are being made. And in general, they are exhibiting bad behavior for Christians. They're exhibiting horrible behavior for Christians. And let's be honest, either you have said or you have heard people say, I'm not going to church. Church is full of jerks. We, we've all heard that. We've all experienced that, right? So, so there, Paul is addressing this. Paul can't be happy. And you see it in this letter. He founded this church five to six years prior to that. It can't be easy for him to find this church that he started, that he loved, literally ripping each other at the seams over nonsensical bad behavior. Remember, I said earlier that First and Second Corinthians are extremely practical letters in the Bible. They have a lot of very easy application and Paul is addressing problems in the church. And he had to have been writing First and Second Corinthians, these two letters with a really heavy heart. In fact, many theologians call Second Corinthians Paul's letter of tears. Because as you read it, he is heartbroken in this letter, seeing the way they're treating each other. And it's, what's really interesting is that the longest unified work that Paul has in the Bible are first and second Corinthians. And in this unified work, he doesn't really get to spend a lot of time describing like huge doctrinal implications with Jesus and the resurrection and the atonement because he's addressing bad behavior. He's addressing how Christians should be living. And in reality, brothers and sisters, we're no better today, right? Over the centuries, over the centuries, we've seen the same problem happen in churches over and over and over again. So God, through his divine providence and, and through the guiding of the Holy Spirit, kept these letters as part of the Bible to help us today because we need them, because we need to learn the lessons that are contained within them. Just a year or two after 1 Corinthians, Paul writes 2 Corinthians and he's covering the same problems. In fact, worse. Because in 2 Corinthians, these people show up that Paul pejoratively refers to as the super apostles. The super apostles are turning everybody on Paul. They're turning everyone on Paul. Paul in that letter calls them false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, openly challenging Paul's authority. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, from experience, that hurts. That hurts. As a leader of a church, when, you, when you're criticized or misunderstood or, or wrongly accused, it hurts. Something that you love, that you put your heart into, it hurts. And if you haven't done it through the leading of a church, I promise you that you've done it through the leading of a ministry that you've done it through a pet project at work that you've loved, that you've spent all of your time on. And then at the very end, someone comes along and tells you, why'd you do it that way? I could have done it better, right? Things like that hurt for someone to wrongly accuse you, for, for someone to, to criticize work that you've done. That hurts deeply, especially when you've put your heart into it. When you hear someone say something to you like, oh yeah, I would love to be a part of that ministry if it's run the right way. Okay, what are you telling me? Stuff like that hurts. And, that's, and this is what Paul is addressing. That's not the way Christian brothers and sisters are supposed to interact. So today, we're gonna learn how Paul addresses these accusers in those first five verses because Paul moves from addressing church problems to, to addressing more personal problems, which are the direct 
attacks against him. If you want to follow this again, we're going to reread verses one through five. And listen to what Paul says here. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. But therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. So what do you do then if you're wrongly accused? What do you do if you're wrongly accused or wrongly criticized? Well, Paul gives us a great example in his response. Paul does it by addressing three things. First, Paul understands his authority or what authority he's, he's operating under. Secondly, he understands his accountability or who he's accountable to, who he's responsible to. And lastly, Paul judges God's final judgment, God's final appraisal, not people's appraisal. So let's go over those three points and see how Paul addresses all three of those. First, for, so verse one where we were, how Paul understands his authority. He says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So Paul said last week, we read it in chapter three, verse five. He said, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you have believed and the Lord assigned to each. Now, this is what's really interesting here. And this is why sometimes reading scripture in English, we lose a little bit. We have to do a little bit of deep diving into it because we lose a little bit of the nuance of what's being said. In chapter three, when Paul said, um, what is Apollos, what is Paul? Servants through whom you've believed. The word that he used there is the, the Greek word doulos, okay? Doulos, if you've been in any Bible studies or been around church for a long time, is a word we hear quite commonly used in the Bible. And doulos is rightly translated as slave or, or bond servant, right? Either one, uh, bond servant, like a butler, you know, somewhat, something like that, right? That's a doulos. However, in the first verse of chapter four of what we read, when Paul says we should be regarded as servants of Christ, he should be regarded as a servant of Christ, he doesn't use the word doulos for servant. He uses the Greek word hyperides. Hyperides. Now, this is interesting. The Greek word hyperides is correctly translated servant, but it's a very uncommon word. It's not used very often at all. The actual literal translation of the word hyperides is under rower. So what is an under rower? Okay, have you ever you guys watch like old movies about like, you know, the pharaohs or the Greeks, whatever? Ben-Hur, if any of you guys have watched Ben-Hur, this is a good example that happens in Ben-Hur. You ever seen those like large, those large pharaoh ships that, that like, there's like 90 oars hanging out from the ship and they're all rowing, right? Okay, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? An under rower is the slave who is responsible for rowing one of those oars, okay? That's a hyperides. Hyperides is an under rower. No engine back in the day, so the hyperides, those under rowers, they were the engine of the ship. Hyperides, unlike a bond servant, had one responsibility, and that responsibility was to start rowing when you're told to row and stop rowing when you're told to stop rowing. That's it. The word is so rare that Paul's use of it had to be deliberate. He, he had to deliberately pick that word, that word. He, in this sentence, is emphasizing the fact that he is a servant of God, of such a lowly estate, right, that he takes his order from God and God alone. He is God's under rower. When God tells me to start rowing, I start rowing. And I don't stop rowing until God tells me to stop rowing. Understand hyperides, they had no status. They had no status culturally, societally, unlike what all the Corinthians were trying to do in the church. The Corinthians were all puffing themselves up and making themselves out to be great. And Paul is saying, hey, I'm just an under rower. As a servant of God, I'm an under rower. I'm a hyperides. 
So what Paul is saying, that as an apostle under authority, that's how he is regarded by God, and that is how other followers of God need to be regarded. Whose authority is Paul under? He is under the authority of Christ. He is under the authority of the master, the one who has called us, the one who has assigned the task. Paul clearly understands where his authority is coming from. He's not just in charge. He is God's hyperides. He is God's under rower. Paul adds another term there that he says he's stewards of the mysteries of God. Now that phrase, the mysteries of God, is commonly used by Paul. If you remember back a few weeks ago, we did a one-week uh, sermon on, uh, the gospel, on the letter of Ephesians where there, the mysteries of God was referring to the church, the, the, the gathering, the ecclesia, right? This, this thing that was hidden in the past. The mystery of the revelation of Christ and the gospel with which we are entrusted with is what Paul is saying that he's a steward of. He received the call to apostleship. He received the responsibility to preach directly from the resurrected Christ himself in a miraculous encounter. And if the house stewards in a house with bond servants, if a house steward is responsible for handling the resources of, acquire, of acquiring food for the household, then the steward of God's mystery is responsible for the dispensation of God's truth, of, of God's word. The mysteries of God, they didn't originate with Paul. They didn't originate with the church, but he's entrusted with it and called to teach it and preach it as it is given to him by his master, by Jesus. In verse two, he says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. What does that mean? Because the, the faithfulness of being a good steward isn't just to be faithful to the task, but the stewards have to be faithful to the truth of God's word. So they shouldn't just be saying, oh, well, what's a good example of this? You ever go somewhere, you ask someone for something? I know that this is like an, an overplayed trope, but if you ever go someplace, yeah, hey, where are the bathrooms? I don't know, I only work here, right? We, we hear this all the time, right? This kind of like, I don't know, I just... I'm, I, but what if someone tells you something that's wrong, right? What Paul is saying here that, that a steward isn't just faithful to accomplish the task. He also needs to be faithful that the task is true, right? It, 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 you're not doing any good if you're accomplishing a task that's wrong. You need to be faithful to the task and to the message. Paul's been preaching and teaching the word of God, the good news of Jesus Christ. And a good steward doesn't speak their own words but obeys the words of the master and proclaims the truth that's been given to him. This is the authority that Paul comes under and Apollos and Peter and everyone else that the Corinthian church is picking signs from. And this comes through an assignment from God, the master, as the head of the ultimate head of the church. And that brings us to our second point. If that's where Paul's getting his authority, where is Paul accountable? What is his accountability? In verse three, Paul says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. That is actually a very important verse. Paul isn't saying, I don't care what you think. What Paul is saying is what you think is really insignificant. That's really what is, it's insignificant what you think. He's putting all of the criticism that he's receiving, he's putting all of that into perspective of the larger court of Jesus. Because the reality is regardless of what people say, regardless of what's going on in the court of, of popular opinion, the final verdict isn't reached until Jesus provides the final verdict. That's why he explains, in this verse, I think sometimes we run past this next part of the verse way too often. I don't even judge myself, Paul said. Even though I'm not aware of anything I've done wrong, even though my conscience tells me I'm fine, I am not thereby acquitted. Why does Paul say that? Why does Paul say, I don't even judge myself, even though my conscience is fine? Because, brothers and sisters, Paul knows 
that there is someone higher than he that he's accountable to. And he's only a servant and he's only a master and he's only a servant and Jesus is the master. Paul also knows that human judgments and and assessments, including our conscience, can be wrong. We can absolutely deceive ourselves. We can absolutely say that something isn't a sin because we like to do it. That's how it works. You know why? Because we're sinful. And do you know what sin likes? Sin likes more sin, not less, not less. So we can absolutely deceive ourselves. And well, this can't be sinful. Why? Because it feels natural. And why would God make me feel natural about something if it's sinful? I'll give you a great example. And I I have to do a confession because today I did something sneaky. Yes. Every Sunday morning, we get donuts from Linda Berlin. And every Sunday morning, there is this really good looking lemon donut that I always say, I'm gonna get that donut after church, after early service. And doggone if someone doesn't get that donut every week. So this week, I took the donut out, I wrapped it up and I hid it in that cupboard back there. (laughs) I did, I totally did. And you know what? My conscience was fine doing that. (laughs) Now, let me go even a step further. Let me go even a step further. When everybody left at 930, I took that donut and I bit into it. I said, Lord, this is so good. It's so tasty. It feels so good going down my throat. There's no way this cannot be healthy for me. Because... (laughs) Because if it weren't healthy, if it weren't healthy, you would not make me crave it so much. (laughs) Now we know that that is a lie, right? (laughs) It's not healthy. And do you know why I crave it? Because (sighs) (laughs) fat craves fat. I can't take it. I can't take it. That's what I crave. Sin craves sin. There's an old saying in Italian that my dad used to use all the time. He would say, pigs dream of the slot bucket. That's what it is. Fat craves fat. Sin cra- Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you right now, sinful actions almost always feel good to the flesh. That's why the Bible tells us we need to become new We need to become renewed. We need to get new hearts. Because dog on it, the heart we're born with likes bad things. And that's just the reality of the curse. So we can't, that's why Paul says, I can't judge myself because I can even delude myself. God, Jesus has to be the standard. He is the ultimate judge. So when, when you tell someone, You can't judge me, only God can. That is absolutely true. That is 100% true. But the next part of that verse is, and when he does judge, he will bring to light what's been done in the darkness. And that should be one, it should be a little scary if we're using the verse, don't judge me, to do things that are wrong, right? We need to know these things, brothers and sisters. Jesus is our ultimate judge. Our feelings can be inaccurate. Our feelings can be biased. That why only, that's why only Jesus can be the judge. That's why in verse five, Paul says, therefore do not pronounce judgment before time, before the Lord comes, because he will bring to light what's hidden in darkness and disclose the purposes of the heart. And then each person will receive their praise. Even if the Corinthians judge Paul, they don't have all of the information about Paul. They can't. They can't know what Paul's doing in his hidden hidden actions. They can't know what Paul's motivations are. Brothers and sisters, we're not able to see everything that a person's done. And we're not able to judge the motives of a heart of an individual. The assurance that we have is that when Christ comes on that day, he will bring to light what has been hidden in the darkness. 
And that brings us to our final point, the appraisal part of the call of a, of, of a steward, of a hyperides. True appraisal has to go beyond what is seen. That's why when Samuel was picking the next king after Saul, what did God tell Samuel? Don't look at the outside because God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outside. The Corinthians, for whatever reason, were fascinated with externals. When we get to chapter 12, they loved people who could talk in tongues and do all sorts of crazy things. That's why Paul tells them in chapter 13, if you do all those things and you don't have the love of Christ, you're nothing. You're nothing. They hold these people in high esteem because of things they can see. But that is not a good assessment of where you are in your relationship with Christ. Don't believe that? What did Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount? In the Sermon of the, on the Mount, Jesus started in chapter 6, verse 1 by saying, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, because you will have no reward from the Father who is in heaven. So he says, be careful what you do in front of others to get credit for it, because you may get credit from them, but you're not going to get credit from God the Father. And then, and then after that, Jesus goes on to tell people, when you pray, pray in private. When you give, give in private. And when you fast, fast in private. And your Father, who knows all things, will reward what you have done in secret. But those are things we can't see. So we think we can't judge. There's also, those are the positive things we do in secret. There's negative things we can do in secret too. Because Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5, 27, you've heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, and that applies the other way too for women that look at men. Anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in their hearts. So what is meant by all that? Well, the reality is when you take all of that together, you could be giving and praying and fasting in private and nobody knows all the good you're doing. You could also be looking good on the outside, but on the inside, be having adultery in your mind and nobody knows that's going on either. That's why we have to be careful to judge on external assessments because they can't be accurate. Brothers and sisters, the faithful servant who has done many unseen acts will be greatly rewarded while the one who has achieved great success in the eyes of the world may not receive any reward at all because they could be a hypocrite serving their own glory and serving their own fame. God judges our hidden actions. God judges our hidden motives. Very often, why you do something is every bit as important, if not more important, than why you're doing something, right? Right? Then, or why you're doing it is more important than what you're doing. Remember what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees. He told them in Matthew 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You're hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs who appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're just dead bones. You outwardly appear righteous to others, but you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What an awful thing to be called. I remember as a little kid, we went by the cemetery in Corleone where they filmed The Godfather. We went by the cemetery and there were all of these huge, awesome monuments. And I remember I looked at my grandpa and he was in the car and I said, grandpa, this is a beautiful cemetery. And my grandpa looked at me, he goes, there's no such thing as a beautiful cemetery. I didn't understand what he meant back then, but I understand what he meant now, right? We wanna have them people with us. All that stuff is, the, the hypocrites were, were dead. The, the scribes and Pharisees were dead. They, they weren't alive. They were like monuments. When Christ returns, brothers and sisters, he'll bring to light everything that was done, done with hidden actions and hidden motives. And then each person will receive their commendation. They'll receive their praise. Paul is leaning towards the positive here. He's saying, if you do and follow the Lord, you will receive his praise. Brothers and sisters, understand this. Even if you've been misunderstood, even if you've been wrongly accused or wrongly persecuted or wrongly criticized, stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to his work because ultimately 
His judgment is the one that counts. At the end of the day, what we all really want to do is hear Jesus say to us in his final phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into your father's rest. So how do, how do we bring all of this together? How do we summarize all this? Paul understands where his authority comes from. He understands where his accountability comes from. And he understands who was doing the appraisal of him. And I appreciate the words of Paul in those circumstances. He was the founder of a church and yet he was rejected. But being true to God, even through his attack, he persevered. And Paul remained true and continued to teach them the truth of God. Paul understood where his authority came from, it came from Jesus. Paul knows who he's accountable to. He's accountable to Jesus and God knows, and Paul knows that ultimately his final appraisal will come from Jesus, not from the Corinthians. And here's the thing, since we're all part of the church, since we're all part of the priesthood of believers in which you are all priests in the kingdom, that's the same authority, accountability, and appraisal that we're all under. We are entrusted, you are entrusted with the gospel. May not be in the same league with Paul, but in our own ways, each one of us is entrusted with that same mystery of God. Don't be discouraged by any difficulties that you face, brothers and sisters. We know who we serve. We know whose authority we're under and we know who we're answerable to. And we will persevere because Jesus has promised to never leave us. And he has promised to never forsake us. Fulfill the will of God. Take delight in what he sees and go on. Amen? And listen, you may make a mistake and that's okay. Think about it this way. I've coached girls softball for so many years and I love it, right? Absolutely love it. If there's a girl on first, I, co I coached baseball too, but girls longer. If there's a girl on first base and the coach gives the steal sign and the girl, as soon as the pitcher pitches, you're running and that girl gets thrown out. Whose fault is that out? Emily, it's the coach's fault, right? The accountability doesn't fall on the player. Actually, that player should get high fives. Why? Because that player did what she was asked to do, right? Brothers and sisters, when we go out and we serve, we're gonna fall on our face. We're gonna get called out. But if we're doing it for God, if we're doing it with the right motive, you give the results to Jesus and you just fulfill what he's asking you to do. We need to be under rowers, hyperides. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And this is a hard message, Lord. So we ask you, Lord, not only to give us the understanding to know who we're accountable to, not only to give us the understanding to know who we're responsible to, who will ultimately judge us, but Lord, give us the strength to really realize that we should not care about the opinion of anyone else other than yours. Jesus, strengthen us in that and let us be strong in that. When we go into a world, Lord, that looks at us sideways, let us continue to grow strong knowing that you support us, knowing that you are our master. And with you, Lord, there's nothing we can't do. Jesus, we love you. Give us humble and loving hearts and let us joyfully be under rowers for you in the kingdom. We love you, Jesus, and we ask for this in your precious name. Amen.
Father, we thank you uh, for this day, Lord, as we leave here. Let us enjoy the weather that you've given us. Let us remember uh, on this Memorial Day the, the veterans that gave their lives. And Lord, let's go out there remembering always that our authority, that our accountability, and our appraisal lies with you. Jesus, we love you. Give us the strength to follow you every day. And we ask for this in your precious name. Amen.